I've chosen perhaps foolishly to talk about a subject that has bothered mankind for many thousands of years. And I'm going to try and condense it into 30 minutes. So I'm, I may need you to uh, switch on your thinking caps and make notes if you wish. If you disagree with anything I say, please feel free to, uh, to come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, don't bother to go on Facebook. I don't have a Facebook presence. There's no use trolling me or saying anything nasty. I will never see it, and it'll just slip over my head. But I'm going to talk about pain and suffering. I'm going to talk about pain and suffering, and the reason I'm doing that is because in my reading of the scriptures, I've come across a verse that I've read many times, and I never connected it with the fact that as Christians, we should not be running away from suffering. You know, uh, if you do remember, Hillary Clinton put out a very nasty speech about the deplorables. What a, she shot herself in the foot. The basket of deplorables. And I want to put it to you that Christians are the deplorables of the known world. You may or may not know, but almost 20,000 Christians die every month. Almost 200,000 Christians are killed every year. I guess you haven't seen that on the TV. Uh, if it was 200,000 people from one particular religion, or if it was 200,000 people from one particular group, the media would be going berserker, but Christians are expendable. And so, together, I want us to consider a passage from Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. Maybe you can turn in your Bibles, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. Paul says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And here comes the verse that really made me think again. That I may know him and the power. I don't know, I seem to have two voices today. Uh, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's close our eyes. Father, we pause for a moment. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for life and breath and everything else that you give us. And Father, as we open your word and we attempt in our puny minds, in our limited uh, spaces that we have where we try to make sense of what is happening in the world. Father, we know that one day you will explain everything to us, but be with us as we open your word together and help us understand in some small way your way and your word is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 2016, the lady heard the banging on the door and when she went to the door, there they were. They said, either you die or you pay us the tax. And that tax was called uh, Jazia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Apparently Arabic is a very difficult language. But this was in Mosul. This mother came to the door and they were standing out there. They wanted the tax or she was going to die. She said, look, I'm going to pay, but I need to 
pay you in a few seconds. My daughter's in the shower, and uh, as soon as she comes out of the shower, uh, I'll pay you. They said, you don't have any time. You don't have a few seconds. They took the torch that was in the shower because there was no electricity in Mosul, and together with a can of petrol, they set the house alight. The mother scrambled around. This is the newspaper article that I'm reading from. The mother scrambled around, grabbed her daughter in the fire. They tried to get out, and they did get out, but they made it to the hospital. And the daughter suffered fourth-degree burns. Now, mostly, most people get first or second or third, but it's not often you get fourth-degree burns. And a few hours later, she died. But before she died, she said to her mother, forgive them. A 12-year-old Christian who was burnt alive because she believed in Jesus. You know, the, this whole topic of suffering is really something which I, in my own thinking, am still studying and reading about and, and, and learning about. And, pardon me, I want to, before we go there, I want to just, um, perhaps as a, an aside, but an aside that is very important to my own understanding, I want to put it out to you, that I disagree vehemently with certain people on the internet that believe that God is responsible for everything that happens in the world. And when I approach this topic of suffering, the question is, is it ordained or is it allowed? In other words, is it the election of God that everything that happens should happen to you or are there things that happen to you because God allows them to happen? There are times when God doesn't allow you to die. There's a woman who was going to uh, fly on the MH370 from uh, the Netherlands, but because the flight was on the Sabbath, she chose another flight. Well, she's still with us. I can give you many stories like that of people who didn't die because of things that happened. And as I was preparing for this topic, and I, I, I'm very nervous about what I'm talking about because, as I said, it's a very contentious subject. This verse came up in the scriptures. Maybe you've got your Bible. Uh, Ezekiel 33 verse 11, you know, this is the beauty of the scriptures. You can read it every day, but every time you read it, you will find something new and something that you hadn't seen before. Ezekiel 33 verse 11, and this is all about the, the um, proposition or the, the doctrine that these people hold that God is sovereign and that everything that happens is because God has made it happen. Ezekiel 33 verse 11, and if you read it, it says, God says, the Lord says, Ezekiel 33 verse 11. 30, sorry, my Aussie is not too good, eh? Whenever I say 30, people say 50. It's not 50, it's 33. 30. I've, got to learn. I've been here 20 odd years, man. I mean, one would have thought I'd have tweaked by now. 30. Are you with me? It's Ezekiel 33, verse 11. What does God say? I take no pleasure in what? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, those are Christians. God takes no pleasure in the death of the Christians. The death of the wicked. But what does God say they must do? Turn. Hang on, wait a minute now. These people are saying that you do what God has put for you to do and you've got no choice about what you do. 
But why would God be asking the wicked people to turn away from their wicked ways? I mean, to me, it doesn't make sense. I'm not a philosopher. I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to study logic so that in my uh, discussions with people, thank you, in my discussions with people, I will be able to stand my ground, you know, because they use big words and, and, and philosoph philosophical terms. And... But to me, that is as clear as day that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hang on, I just gave you another verse. You know where that verse is? It's in the New Testament, obviously, isn't it? But just think about it. I'm taking you where I've been taken in my own mind. In Genesis chapter 2, if God made you with no choice, if everything that happens to you is what God has ordained for you, why did God give Adam and Eve a choice in the garden? If he knew they were going to sin, which he did, why did he give them a choice to sin or not to sin? <laughs> Pardon me. So I want to put it to you. I've got more verses here, but I don't know about the time. Um, that God allowed evil to happen. God did not go to Satan with a gun and say, look, you're not proud enough. I'm going to make you prouder. I want you to want my place. God was not responsible for the origin of evil, which happened in a mysterious way. The Bible is, is very clear that there are many mysteries in the scripture that we don't know about. And that's why there's going to be an eternity, because God will be explaining these things to us. John 3 verse 16, you all know that verse. You don't need to look it up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everyone, God is not choosing, slicing and dicing, wanting only the people that come from the wealthy side of town and, and throwing the deplorables that Hillary Clinton spoke about in the basket so that they can be burnt in hellfire. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat. So I want to put it to you with just those verses that God does not ordain evil. God is not responsible for every evil act that has happened to this world. Just think about it. I mean, all these people that operate in the dark side of the world, that, 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 that do all these terrible things to children, is God responsible for all the evil? No. He's a God of love. He's a God of inclusion. He wants us to be in his family. That's why he sent Jesus to bring us back from death. <laughs> and so God allows things to happen and God allows suffering to happen. And sometimes suffering happens to us and uh, we're not happy. Um. You know, there's, a, there's, there's different ways of looking at suffering, isn't there? I remember taking my, uh, my girlfriend, who's now been my wife for 37 years, I took her to the opera. Uh, sorry, not the opera, to the symphony. Not the opera. I hate opera. If you take me to, op to the opera, I'll be holding my ears closed the whole, the whole uh, in time. But we went to the symphony orchestra. Man, did she suffer. She didn't say anything. You know, she sat there looking very interested, but she hated it. But that's a type of suffering, isn't it? I mean, if, I, if you took me to La Traviata, I would be dying. I, I, I'd want to leave as soon as I can. So, <laughs> pardon me, there are certain things that some people call suffering, and there are things that other people don't call suffering. And <laughs> to me, it's... Uh, it's so interesting what happened to the disciples, although we won't be going there, what happened to the disciples after Jesus died. When they were hauled in front of the Sanhedrin and they were given a few taps, I don't know which part of the anatomy, and they left the room rejoicing. Do you remember that verse? Because they were worthy to suffer in the name of Jesus. So they, 
they didn't run away from it. They almost welcomed it. But in, in our passage today, uh, we want to look at Paul in this book of Ephesians. Uh, Philippians, sorry. Uh, I preached on Ephesians this morning. I mustn't get confused. Um, so you all know, I'm sure, that the book of Ephesians was one of the prison epistles. Now, mo- some of you that know me, I, I see some new faces. Uh, it's difficult when people are right at the back of the room. Some people I can hardly see, but maybe I need new glasses. I should have gone to Specsavers. But um, <laughs> it's difficult to write from prison. I don't know if you've ever been to prison. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I work in Australian prisons. And uh, man, they live in luxury. They've got brevels, they've got toasters, they've got TV, they've all got mattresses. Uh, some of them have got single rooms. I mean, I was speaking to a patient uh, the other day, and uh, he told me he'd been the sweeper in, in a jail, uh, in, in Cessna, actually, and within one month, 40 people went home and they came back. The same people. And uh, in fact, the one man... He was about to clean the man's cell, and the governor said, no, don't bother. I know he's coming back. And he was. He was there the next day. Uh, (laughs) It's not funny, really, because a lot of these people are institutionalized, but a lot of them don't have anywhere to go. So they do petty crime so that they can have free meals a day. They can have uh, free electricity and free water, free showers, and a place to sleep. They don't have to defend their little pets from somebody stealing their, their mattress or whatever the case may be. <laughs> so Paul writes Philippians from the jail. And in biblical times, I, I can't imagine, I mean, the, the, the accounts I've read of the jail, they certainly not lux the lux. You know, I went to the Philippines. I, I, maybe I shouldn't tell the story because there may be some Filipino people here. And um, uh, it it was an eye-opener. It was an eye-popper. I I lost four kilos. I love the Filipino people. Don't get me wrong, I'm going again this year. But I don't love the food. And I lost four kilos. Well, I got more to lose than four kilos. But for the first time, I had to wash in a bucket. And it was called the Paradise Resort. I couldn't get over it. I had to go and buy a jug so that I could warm the water so that I could wash with warm water. But having said that, I was, I was, I was so shocked by the poverty that I saw. People living in shacks. Okay, we got shacks in South Africa, but they're made from cars. They're made from zinc, and they, they've got structure. They're living in shacks of... Of, of bamboo and, and, and branches, and, and you walk in off the road and you're right in the front door, there's nothing on the floor. It was a real eye opener. But you know, some of us may think that's suffering, but the suicide rate in the Philippines for men and women is one tenth the suicide rate in Australia. So, where is the suffering? Suffering is a mental thing. I want to put it to you, it's a mental thing. <laughs> Pardon me. And often our suffering, there may be a psychiatrist here, they can correct me if I'm wrong, is self-induced. We set up a mental block against somebody that we don't like, and then whenever we see them, we get upset. So in this passage of scripture, uh, the, the, the book of scripture, Paul is writing from jail, but the book is full of the word rejoice. Notice in the, in the, uh, the first chapter, chapter uh, 1 verse 4, he says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. I always pray with joy. And then in verse um, in verse. Uh, 18 he says yes and I will continue to rejoice 
the most important thing reading from the, the beginning of the verse is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. And then in verse uh, 18 again of chapter 2, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Um, and in verse 4 of chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. The whole book is full of this recurring theme that life as a Christian should be a life of rejoicing, that it should be a life of joy. And, and certainly, I believe, I feel, and I do believe that we can choose our mood. We can choose the frame of mind, the attitude of mind that we have for the day. Notice here in verse, um, verse uh, 5 of chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Some people, in some versions, it says your mind, you should have the same frame of mind, your, <laughs> have this attitude, this frame of mind, this mindset that Jesus had. And Jesus' mindset certainly was not a mindset of darkness, of doom. Uh, he knew that he was going to die. He knew how he was going to die. He knew that before he died, but yet he was always never discouraged, always pleasant, always happy. And Paul, Paul is saying that that should be the same thing with us as Christians. And verse 8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So the whole book is full of this theme of rejoicing, and yet in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says these words that we've read as our, as our scripture reading. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And then he says again in verse 8, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count all those things but rubbish. Paul went through a lot. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 recounts how many times he was flogged, how many times he was stoned, how many times he was left for dead, how many times he was shipwrecked, he was left hungry. He suffered a lot of privation. But now that he's in jail, now that he's gone through all those things, he's still saying that our mindset should be the same as that of Jesus. And that he is happy that he's given away all these things. He says, <laughs> pardon me, I have suffered the loss and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. All of this is going towards what he finally says in those, those two verses, verse 10 and verse 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You see, it's, it, it's um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Pertinent? It's an imperative. That's, I think, the more forceful word. It's an imperative in the Christian life. We must not only know Jesus, but we know the power of his resurrection. Because what does the resurrection portend for us as Christians? The fact that Jesus came and that Jesus died portends that we too may share in his resurrection. We will share in the life that he shared because he broke the bonds of death. He broke the shackles of death. And he opened for us as Christians, as believers... He opened for us a mental, almost like a doorway, a, a way that we can look at, that we can see as the end to this world with all its sin and its suffering and its cancer and its pain and its evil. When he died and when he was resurrected, he opened the escape route to the world for each one of us as Christians. And so because of that, because we want to, pardon me, we want to share in that resurrection. We don't walk around with fear. We don't walk around with trepidation. We don't walk around wondering when they're going to come and knock at our door. And I want to put it to you, friends, 
the knocking is going to come to us too. We may be looking at the people in uh, Iraq and saying, whoa, those poor Christians in Iraq, they're going through a lot. But the scripture is very clear. Those that follow Jesus will suffer. Jesus said that himself. In the world you will have tribulation. But what did he say? Take heart, I have overcome the world. So tribulation is going to come. We don't know when and we don't know how. We don't know what pattern it will take. But it's very clear from Scripture that tribulation is going to come to everybody who stands for Christ, who takes their, their stand on the side of Christ. I go to Villawood in the mornings and uh, I have Bible studies there in Villawood. I'm, uh, I'm the official visitor for the church. And at the moment, we're going through the book of Revelation. I don't know if you ever read the book of Revelation, but isn't it just fantastic how God, right from the beginning, he had a plan that was going to culminate in our <laughs> recapture, if I can put it that way, in our rescue. And the book of Revelation lays that out for each one of us. That's why we should study that book together with the book of Daniel, so that we can see that God is a God of inclusiveness. He wants us to be in the know. He's not doing things, I've said this here before, but he's not doing things in the kitchen and then coming out with a big surprise. He wants us to be in the know. The, the book of Amos, there's a verse there, Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, <laughs> I'm at the risk of being boring, I'm going to say it again. I've read it many times, but just last year I realized what it really says. Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret plans to his servants, the prophets. That's what the verse says. I mean, that's, to, to me, that's just amazing. Here, God is telling us already in Amos that he's not going to do anything behind the, the, behind the scenes. He's going to include us in everything that's going to happen. But you know what the flip side of that is? The flip side is when 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 happens, what are we going to say? Oh, we didn't know. We, I didn't read the book of Revelation. It's not my fault that I don't know what's going to happen. God is taking us all into his confidence. We may have mysteries in scripture in terms of the love of Jesus, in terms of the mystery of the gospel, <laughs> pardon me, in terms of the mystery of iniquity that came in uh, Satan's mind up in heaven. But there's no mystery about what is going to happen on this planet. And so Revelation makes it very clear that we will be marked into two people and those who are marked as having Jesus mark, as having the mark of God, will suffer persecution. And here Paul is, I don't want to say he's inviting it, but he's making it very clear that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. It's as... Uh, it's as, as if he's, he's almost saying, go on, do it. I want to experience this for myself. And he did experience it for himself. He did suffer for the name of Jesus. He did die for the name of Jesus. <laughs> Pardon me. And he did stay true to the name of Jesus. And he goes on to say, being conformed to his death. That word conformed only appears once in the, in the Bible. And it's a very difficult word. I, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I can't uh, pronounce it properly, but the end part of the word is similar to the word that we get the English word metamorphosis from. In other words, I want to be almost molded or, or fashioned or, or traced out to have a similar profile as Jesus has. And, pardon me, and take part in his death myself. And then he, he, he says in verse 11, in order that I may attain 
to the resurrection from the dead. So suffering is not something that we should uh, welcome. I'm not saying that everybody must go out now and start uh, bashing people with the truth over their heads and, and inviting confrontation. I had a, a patient at, um, at a, a particular jail who used to come to me complaining of pain all the time. And then one day, uh, one night, um, uh, a big parcel appeared on the other side of the fence. And that night, um, the officers did nothing. They just left the parcel there. That night, he and two or three others, they stacked up. The, the bins and they jumped over, or they tried to. He was the only one that made it over the fence. And he fell on the ground and broke both his ankles. Well, he was in a lot of pain. And he hobbled away and lay in the bush the whole night until the next morning. Uh, and then tried to, tried to uh, hitchhike <laughs> in his prison green. So he stood out like a sore thumb. And of course, was back in jail. Very wise. But boy, did he have a lot of pain. I'm not saying we must invite suffering. I'm not saying we must follow that silly bloke. But certainly when suffering comes, friend, you can read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Have any of you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Most of the stories, I haven't read the whole book. It's a very thick book. Most of the stories in that book make it very clear that the people who die don't suffer. In fact, there's a story of a man and they, who was going to die on Thursday, for example, let's say Thursday, and his friend said to him, if you suffer, don't raise your arm, but if you're not suffering, raise your arm. And his friend stood there waiting, and the flame, flames were crackling, and the, the, the fat was dripping off his body. And nothing happened until virtually when he was a skeleton, his friend saw his arm going up. God will always protect us. If we welcome the fact that God is on our side, if we know that at the end of it all there is going to be meaning, if we, like Paul, say that we want to be part of the resurrection from the dead, we don't have to run away from or, or go and sit in a corner and, 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 and try and get an atomic shelter uh, so that we'll be protected from any bad thing that happens. God allows suffering for a reason. And part of the reason is because he's looking for diamonds. You know, I, I, uh, I don't know, I seem to have a particular talent to write poems when my friends die. And uh, I wrote my sister a poem. Before she died, I couldn't find it. I spent hours looking for it on my computer. But the poem that God gave me was about the fact that he's looking for diamonds. You know how diamonds get formed? 300 degrees centigrade temperature and 10 bars of pressure. So diamonds are formed by a combination of heat and pressure. And friends, when God allows us to go through suffering, it's not because he's trying to teach us a lesson. All the lessons are here. We know all the lessons. But he knows that there are things in our lives that we need to get rid of. He knows that there are things in our lives that are going to hamper us from being in heaven. That are going to hinder us. That are going to stand as a barrier between us and God. He loves us so much that he allowed his son to die as a criminal Naked, bleeding, soiled. Don't believe those pictures you see of, of Jesus hanging on the cross where he's got a cloth. He wasn't 
covered with a cloth. When you were crucified, you lost your bowels, you lost your bladder. You lost everything. And you died in agony. And God had to see all this happen. Not because he wanted it to happen, as the Calvinists want us to believe, but because he loved us and he's waiting to come and take us out of this world. And so when suffering comes, bear the cross of Jesus with honor because Jesus bore the cross with honor for each one of us. Father, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for your great love in, 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 in sending Jesus to this one small planet. Oh Lord, what an insignificant piddling little planet it is in the scheme of things. If it was not here in this galaxy, nobody would notice the difference. But Lord, you saw that on this planet there was a person who needed Jesus. And so you sent Jesus to die for that person. And Lord, I thank you that Jesus came to die for me. I thank you that Jesus came to die for everybody who's here in this auditorium today. And Father, not all of us are going to suffer before Jesus comes. Not all of us will need to suffer before Jesus comes. Some of us may pass peacefully in our sleep. Some of us may pass <laughs> peacefully on the operating table. Some of us may pass in an instant and not suffer at all. But Father, for those that you can see will suffer in your name. And if I'm one of them, Lord, please use me, not to my glory, but to your glory. And all of us, Father, may we all determine because of your great love to commit ourselves to you, to put you first in everything that's happening to us day by day, to live as if Jesus could be coming tomorrow because, Father, tomorrow may not come for some of us. And so let us live each day as if it was our last day on this earth and that we were ready to meet Jesus, regardless of what happens to us. May we be willing to stand and to be branded as Nun, Christians, Nazarenes, those who have accepted Jesus as their Savior, and who know that he's coming back again. And may that certainty, Father, give us the joy and the peace and the hope that the world doesn't have, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Rob
that light to still hold the candle without a flame. Carry your candles, run to the darkness, seek out the helpless, confused and torn. Hold out your candle for. Yo